discouragement and the Christian. How should we handle it? Hi, and welcome to Simply Christ. My name is Mark Shepard. I'm glad you're here with us. We want to welcome back our subscribers. If you're not a subscriber, you know what to do. Subscribe. You know the rest. Hit the like button, leave a comment, share this with your friends. Let's get right to it. But before we do that, let's start off with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for everything you have done for us. We thank you for your love, for your kindness. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, the power to overcome. Father, we often get discouraged. Help us to overcome discouragement and live the life that you have promised us that we can have. We always ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I guarantee you, every single one of you, including myself, has had to deal with discouragement. In fact, you might be right now in a state of discouragement. How should we deal with discouragement? Is it even right to be discouraged? Because many Christians have this idea that if they're discouraged, there's something wrong with them, that God is maybe angry with them, and they begin living in fear, and they start developing a depression. Well, let's get something straight right off the bat. Discouragement is very normal to your walk in Jesus, and there's a lot of reasons for being discouraged, but the good news is there's a lot of reasons why not to be discouraged and how you can overcome that discouragement, and we're going to be looking at some of those starting right now. Let's discuss a little bit about what discouragement can do to us and and how it impacts other people that we find in the New Testament. Number one, discouragement can impact our growth with Christ because we feel that we can't live up to certain things. And since we can't live up to these things, God therefore must not really care for us. And it can many times, if it starts turning into a depression or a fear, we can leave God altogether and not have anything to do with him. Um, When it comes to dealing with people in the Bible who've had it, everybody that you see in the New Testament and the Old Testament has experienced it. So don't be fearful that there's something wrong with you necessarily in the sense of maybe you're dealing with some type of discouragement. Look at the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets dealt with discouragement. Elijah, Elisha, they all dealt with it. David, many of the Psalms that David wrote were dealing with seasons of discouragement. Many of the psalmists write about their discouragement. In fact, the Old and the New Testament is filled with people who were discouraged. So what can we do to, I guess, overcome this? What can we do to deal with discouragement? Well, there's uh, several things we can do. And the first one is, is to examine the self. And what that means is to stop and do an honest critique of the reasons why are we maybe are discouraged. And there might be some surprising reasons. One of them is envy. It's very easy to become discouraged when we envy somebody. And that can take place whether in a professional world that you're working in, your job, maybe your uh, friends that you have that you see getting ahead. And it can also be in ministry. I know many ministers who are very discouraged in their ministry, and they look at it and they think that, well, look at all these other ministers. They're so so popular on their YouTube channels. They have hundreds of thousands of followers, um, their Twitter account, or whatever the case is. They don't see themselves as being popular, and they think that, well, I must not be doing God's work. God must not be pleased with me, and therefore, since I'm not popular... I am now becoming discouraged. And it could be also just by watching the world and seeing how the world works and seeing people who are worldly get ahead. And we're here sitting here thinking, oh my goodness, what am I doing wrong? Shouldn't I be getting ahead more so? And that's really a problem that many Christians have, not just in the the world that they work in, and but also dealing with with many ministers and pastors. I dealt with a pastor one time in India who was very discouraged because they were seeing other pastors and other ministers getting ahead and their ministry just wasn't working. So it became a thing of an ego and it really wasn't based 
on anything of a spiritual nature. So their entire life dealt with their their ego and how it was to pump themselves up in reality. That is not what really we should be looking at. That's not how God operates. God operates in the way God operates. We're his servants. We do things. And if we don't understand that concept, we will become discouraged. There are many people that we read about in the New Testament and the Old Testament. We read their names and that's it. Look at the apostles. Look at the ones that Jesus chose to be his chosen 12. We know Peter, of course, and we know Matthew, we know John, we know Paul wrote most of the New Testament. But what about some of the other apostles that were part of his group, his 12, they never wrote anything. And all we know is just stories about them. And in some of them, we don't really know much about them except that Jesus chose them and that was it. If they start doing comparisons, they if a person starts doing comparisons, we have to start looking at how the apostles would do. Um, you know, it's not, this is not a one-up game. This is not who's more popular, more famous. And we have a problem with that in our society. We're so popularity oriented. We're looking for fame. And we couch that in a spiritual holiness. Well, I'm only doing this for, for God. But that's not what God is calling us to do. God is not calling us to be popular or to be famous. God is asking us to do his will and not to be discouraged. Now, I could throw a bunch of verses out there telling you not to be discouraged, but I really want to give you some good tips on what to do. And the first one, like I said, is to make sure to understand that we have to examine the self. And that also means to examine our sin. Maybe we're in a state of sin that we've not repented of. And what happens in that is we find ourselves struggling in our Christian walk, but we're dealing with this sin. We've not dealt with it correctly. We're, of course, dealing with temptation, and we let that temptation overcome us, and we just kind of brush it off and not think anything of it, and we say, well, God's grace will save me, and it's okay where well, I can continue doing this sin. But if we continue doing that, we will become discouraged because the Christian walk is is about the overcoming of the self. It's about the overcoming of sin. It's about learning to live the spiritual life. And if we are not making progress in that, then we find ourselves becoming discouraged. So examine the self. Another one is maybe dealing with the lack of forgiveness for ourself. We're not forgiving ourselves. Even though God has forgiven us, we are still dealing in our life with the lack of forgiveness for ourself. And that is a tool that Satan uses. He'll tell you, you're not really forgiven. God has not really forgiven you for the things that you've done. When in reality, he has. And we listen to that voice. Remember, Satan, or God rather, will never use discouragement. It's Satan who uses the tool of discouragement. Now, God will use guilt to prod us into something. But after that guilt is made us into uh, taking action towards something, the guilt should be gone because God forgives us in those sins that we have if we confess and we repent of those things. And then that guilt should be gone because we're no longer living in guilt. But what Satan does is he uses that guilt, continues, he pushes us, and then we start becoming discouraged. So if you've been forgiven, realize you've been forgiven. Move on. Yes, it'll still nag you. And that may be one of the consequences that it'll always come up and you'll remember those things. But at the same time, remember you've been forgiven from that. And we have to understand that. Another reason is we are not really seeing things uh, in a spiritual way. We become spiritually empty. And that's another thing we need to look at when we, the number one in tip number one or number one thing we need to look at is maybe a spiritual emptiness we have in us. We become spiritually empty and that's because I think is that so much of our church life is geared toward what we do on a Sunday or knowing theology. And I'm not saying those things are not important, but what I'm saying is that those things are not the goal in themselves. We are not to be called Bible scholars and knowing where to dot all the I's and cross the T's. Yes, those are important. We're not called to go to church and 
experience some big thing every Sunday morning. Yes, those things are important, but that's not the end in themselves. And too many Christians, especially in the West, do not understand the idea that this is a spiritual life we're called to live. And so what happens is we go through all our church services and we do all these things. We become theological, theologically sound, but inside we're empty. And we question, but I don't understand it. I go to church. I'm part of a ministry. Uh, I know my theology. I can stand for baptism. I can stand for this theological construct. But God is asking us to have our lives changed, our spirits changed, to be born again. That's the rebirthing process, a rebirthing of the spiritual person. And if we've not done that, and we rely only on our church services and our theological constructs, we will become discouraged because our soul, our spirit is looking for something more of importance. So if we don't do that, we will become discouraged. Number two, we have to change our expectations. Changing our expectations means that we have to really stop and think about what we expect from being a Christian. Many people have this idea, once they become a follower of Jesus, well, after I become a follower of Jesus, everything should be fine. I shouldn't have any problems. Or if I do have a problem, there's an answer right away. God will appear and take care of it, and I shouldn't have any issues. I might have to suffer for a day or two, but that's it. Some even push it to the point of becoming wealth and health. You should always be healthy. You should always be wealthy. And if you're not, you are not living the Christian life. And many, many people live that life and become discouraged because they think that they're not being a follower of Jesus because they're not experiencing health. They're not experiencing wealth. And they think that the promises of God are that you're going to be rich and you'll never be sick. That is not what God promises. There are many people that I know in India, all through Asia, in Myanmar, in Burma, and many of you who are experiencing the Christian life and are living for Christ, but you're not wealthy at all. You are facing persecution. You're having your property taken from you. You're sick and you're praying to God and you're, you're thinking to yourself, maybe, I hope not, but maybe you're thinking to yourself, God is not really loving me. I'm not living the Christian lifestyle. So I become discouraged because my expectations are incorrect. God is not saying he will promise to heal you from every single disease. Now, I know some people are going to be upset about that, but God did not promise that you are never, ever going to be sick. You're going to get stomach viruses. You're going to have illnesses. And one day we will all die from an illness. At least most of us will. That's just what's going to happen. We're not going to be necessarily rich. And what is rich, right? Jesus has many warnings about being rich. That's for another topic. But I want you to understand that do not become discouraged when you start thinking about whether your health, if you're healthy or if you're wealthy. Change our expectations. It's not about those kind of things. We have to understand that the spiritual life is a difficult lifestyle. The spiritual life is one of difficulty at times. And let's read a passage of scripture here. It is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, reading from the Aramaic scriptures. Enter in the narrow gate, because broad is the gate, and wide is the way which leads unto destruction. And many are those who go in it. How small the gate, and narrow the way that leads unto life, and few of those who find it. Many use this scripture as to determine how few people are going to be in heaven and how many more people are going to be in hell. I would like to look at it as in another way, I'm not saying that that way is wrong necessarily, but let's look at it a little bit deeper than that. This verse Jesus is talking about is about the Christian lifestyle. Remember, the Christian life, read it again. Enter the narrow gate, because broad is the gate, and wide is the way that leads to, unto destruction. And many are those who go in it. How small the gate, and narrow the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Now, there's some words in there that are very consistent. One of them is way, and another is gate. So what is this gate in this way? This gate is this entrance into a lifestyle. 
but that lifestyle is the way. Remember, the early Christians were called members of the way. Isn't that interesting? Members of a way, the way of life. And this way of life Jesus is describing here is not necessarily just about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. It's about the life that you right now are experiencing. You are experiencing a lifestyle. The question is, what lifestyle are you experiencing? When we look at the passage, enter in the narrow gate, because broad is the gate and wide is the way that leads unto destruction. That destruction is not necessarily about the end. Of course it is, but it's also about the life that we live. This narrow way, or this wide way, if we're living in this, this broad way, this this life that there are no boundaries, you do what you want, that's going to bring discouragement because that is the way of the world. The way of the world is of no boundaries. If we are living as a Christian and we have no boundaries in our life, if we're not living that kind of life with boundaries, we're going to become discouraged because that's not the life we're called to live. Yet, if we live in the way that Jesus describes here, how small the gate and narrow the way that leads unto life, and few are those who find it. That leads into what? Life. Remember, there are other, another couple of words that we see in here are destruction and life, right? Destruction is the life that people in the world experience in their everyday living. It's that destruction of no boundaries that no boundaries brings. But the way of life, what did Jesus say about life in John 10, 10? I've come to give you life and to have it abundantly. This life isn't for the afterworld. It's for now. Jesus promises a life now, but that life has certain elements and characteristics. It's a narrow way. It's a way of boundaries. It's a way of living in the spiritual realm where you are always looking to see how the Spirit would want us to react. We react in the way that God wants us to react. The way of the world is very broad. The way of the Spirit is narrow. It has boundaries. It's not constricting. It's just a narrow way. Have you ever been on a big, wide area and you're looking for the path well if that's the path you could go anywhere right but if you're in the forest and you find a narrow way a way you know where that path is you know where you're going because the boundaries that path the path itself will guide you in the direction you're going you know where to go that's that narrow way the narrow way illuminates it gives us an area to see a way to travel if it's broad then everything is a path right we want to follow the narrow way not the broad way, okay? Follow the narrow way and not the broad way. But there's another element that you're going to find in this, this expectation is that the deeper you go into it, you are going to find yourself becoming lonelier. And let, let me explain this to you. When you look at the early followers of Jesus, when you look at Jesus himself, Jesus, of course, being the Christ, living in the fullness of the Spirit, many times found himself lonely. He found himself abandoned. Many of his disciples left him. Many times he'd find large crowds and they would leave him. And the only people that were left were his small band of followers. But most of those, if not all, left him at the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter went in, of course, followed, denied him, but at least he still went in and followed. And John was with Mary when Jesus was on the cross. So we still see a little bit of connection there, but Jesus was lonely. That was because he was in such a deep state of spiritual life, living, of the spiritual life, that you're going to be different from other people. Now, is that to say we are Jesus? No. But what I'm saying is that the deeper you go into the spiritual life, you are going to run the risk of being discouraged because you're going to find yourself thinking different than other people. So the lonelier you become, now examine yourself. Are you lonely because you're just not a person who's easy to get along with or you have some really kind of weird habits that nobody really appreciates? What I'm talking about is the spiritual depths that you go, you start looking at things differently. Most people aren't going to look at that. Again, broad is the way, right? 
Broad is that way. Many people go that route. But the person who stays on the narrow way, the more they go on that path, the deeper they go into that way, into that forest. People don't want to go into that. So you're over here looking at things one way in the narrow way. They're looking at it in the broad way. And I'm even talking about people who proclaim to be Christians. They're, on, they're not on that narrow way. They're on that broad way, and their life is destructive. They're finding destruction in it. So the person who's on the narrow way, the more they go into it, it's easy to become discouraged because you find yourself alone. You see people on the broad way thinking, maybe that's where it's at. Don't let that fool you. Don't be discouraged by that. Follow those that continue to follow that narrow way. The early church fathers, the early church teachers, they were lonely many times. They found themselves looking for you know, um, guidance and for friends, and they found themselves very empty and alone. Read on some of those. You will find those, and you will find the deeper they go, the lonelier they become, and that can lead to discouragement. But again, look at your expectations. Change your expectations of what Christianity is. It is a spiritual path. The deeper you go into it, the more that you find it. It'll give you greater joy, but the greater risk of discouragement comes because Satan is trying to get you off that path and on more into the Broadway. Let's move on to point number three. Remember that it is a process. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's a process. Paul is talking about a process that we go through. We are born again. If we are born again, we are going to to, I have to understand that we're starting off as babes in Christ. We are babies. We're infants. We're still taking the very basic things. And if we're not growing fast enough, we become discouraged. And especially in a society that wants everything right now, right away, quick. We live in a society of just give it to me now. We have drive through. We want instant, <laughs> instant microwavable things. Uh, we want to become president and CEO of a company in, in five years. And if we're not there, we become discouraged. We want to reach a certain, a certain level. If not, we become discouraged. And it's the same thing in our spiritual life. And it shouldn't be that way because it's about patience. It's about long-suffering. Don't be discouraged if you don't seem to be growing in the way, or as quick, rather, as what you think you ought to be growing. If we're doing what we should be doing, in our Christian walk, you know, we will grow. And look at those things. What maybe are some of the things that are on our path that we're stumbling across? Maybe it's a hole that we keep falling into. If we keep falling into that hole and keep getting out of that hole, maybe and if we just keep falling into it, maybe we're not doing something. We need to rethink those things and grow quick and, and grow, and that'll help us grow quicker. But remember, it's a process. God is changing. God God is working on you. Have faith in God that he's working you with this process. Don't become discouraged if we are not growing as quickly as what we want to. Jesus' disciples went through a process. Look at Peter. Peter, this impetuous man. Everybody points at Peter, and I don't know why, because Peter gets the, you know, the, the brunt of all the jokes. Oh, impetuous Peter. But remember something. Peter walked on water. He's the only one who got out of the boat, right? None of the others did. So I like Peter. But you look at Peter at the beginning, and if you look at Peter, even after Jesus rose from the dead, Paul had to confront Peter on certain things. Peter was still growing. He was still having difficulties and issues. But the thing is, is he was growing. Because if you look at First and Second Peter, when you look at the writings of that man, there are different from what the person was who Jesus first saw or first talked to and brought in as a disciple, isn't he? Even the early disciples went through a process. So it is a process. We're being born again. We are moving. Let's go to point number four, and that is learn to listen to the Spirit. Let me just give you a personal example. There's many times I would see Jesus and I would say, wow, if I could only go back and sit at Jesus' feet. Things would be different in my life today. Don't I wish I had Jesus? And if he was here, right here right now, things would be so different. I want to challenge you on that. We like to think that, that if Jesus was here today, we'd ask him these questions. He'd answer immediately just like he did because he would be right in front of us. I want us to rethink that, and I want us to look at a verse here. John 16, 6 through 13. Again, 
in the Aramaic scriptures. For I have told you all these things, and sorrow has come and has filled your hearts. Let me stop here for just a second. Jesus is telling his disciples, look, I'm going to have to leave. Some of you are going to be persecuted. And of course, they're going, my goodness, the Son of God, he's, he's going to be leaving. He doesn't quite un- they don't quite understand what's happening. And the discouragement they were going to face afterwards, they didn't really quite understand because they were discouraged. But look what Jesus says next. But I'm speaking the truth unto you, that it is better for you that I go. For if I don't go, the advocate, the helper, will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him to you. What is Jesus saying here? I mean, wouldn't you think it would be better for Jesus to stay and to teach his disciples? But that's not what Jesus says. He says that it is better for you that I go. For if I don't go, the advocate, the helper, will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Look what he says next. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and concerning righteousness and concerning judgment. Concerning sin, because they don't believe in me. Then concerning righteousness, because I go to my Father and you will not see me again. Then concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, age, is judged. Again, there is much I have to say unto you, but you are not able to grasp it now. So the idea uh, that if Jesus was here, we wouldn't be discouraged is, is not true. Because those people back then were even discouraged with Jesus. But Jesus is very, he's very straightforward in this. That it's better that I go because I'm going to send you something even greater, an advocate, a helper, a being that's going to guide you unto all truth. Like he says in the next verse, but when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you in all the truth. For he will not speak from his soul's mind, but rather all that he will hear, the one will speak and he will make the future known unto you. I think this is one of the most crucial verses in the Bible when it comes to discouragement and spiritual living. Jesus is saying that I need to send this spirit, this advocate, this helper to you so you can know all the truth. Because if I'm here with you, he won't come to you. See, Jesus fulfilled his mission. He's the teacher. He's the rabbi. He's the sacrificial lamb. Now something even greater is coming in because what happens on the day of Pentecost? The Spirit comes and everybody was amazed. But what happens is Peter preaches and he says, why are you amazed at this? Isn't this what was prophesied by Joel? I will pour out my Spirit, the pouring of the Holy Spirit upon Everyone who will accept the Spirit is the greatest of all things because the Spirit is an advocate. He's a helper. It is the being. It's a counselor who takes us deeper. So don't be discouraged thinking about Jesus as far away. Listen to the Spirit because Jesus has given us something even greater. And when I talk about the Spirit, I'm not talking about the the uh, parlor tricks that you might see on some at some church service or some type of weird stage antic that I'm talking about the deep spiritual living listen to the spirit what can uh, what is the spirit trying to teach us but that means we have to listen because the spirit is going to guide us into all these things he's our helper in times of discouragement he's our he's our guide He will provide the answers if we will only listen to him. If we don't, we will become discouraged. It's about the spiritual life. The deeper we get into it, the spirit talks to us. The more we hear and we start living in a different world and we start living in this spiritual way. So remember these four things. Number one, examine the self. Number two, change our expectations. Number three, remember it's a process and listen to the Spirit. Again, discouragement can be overcome if we listen to the Spirit of God and we use this this process, that use these things, these tools to help us see. There's many more, but at least these are four. Next time, we're going to talk about some of the things to do to listen to the Spirit in our next video. Until then, God bless. Again, subscribe, share, like, comment. Greatly appreciate you. We'll see you on the next video.